Hi, this is Vahid Razavi. I'm uh, running this video for uh, potential um, folks that are looking to vote for various candidates in our upcoming election. Tom Gallagher is running against Nancy Pelosi in the 12th District in, Calif in San Francisco, representing about four-fifths of the city of San Francisco. Tom has been a activist for most of his life and has published numerous books. Tom is also very much involved in anti-militarism and, and, and anti-military complex and war. So Tom, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I wanted to get first an understanding of uh, why you're running against Nancy Pelosi and why now. Well, the now um, is easily answered in the sense that this is her last run, as far as we can tell. She uh, said she would just be speaker for four years, um, and this would be the third and fourth year. Um, why in general? Uh, because the work that Nancy Pelosi does um, that is high profile nationally is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, in the sense that beating Trump, impeaching Trump is necessary, but if we think that's going to solve all our problems, it's not. Nancy Pelosi is not representative of her district, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that is in medical care, that is in military policy, the Green New Deal, for instance. Okay. Um, in regards to Nancy's uh, his current impeachment of the Donald Trump, where do you think that's going to go and in what direction would the country be headed in the next few months? Are we going to be having Trump in office in a year from now? Well, uh, I place little value in my predictive powers. I should tell you that first off. I generally try to confine myself what I think with what I think should be done rather than what will happen. Um, the conventional wisdom, which I have no reason to dispute, is he will be impeached and uh, acquitted in the Senate. Um, something, it's hard to know what big thing could break um, that would change that in the sense that what big thing hasn't broken. Yeah. He's been profiting off of uh, holding public office in a, a violation of the emoluments clause since before he got into office. Uh, he's selling influence. Uh, internationally, um, disregards all as numerous aspects of the Constitution. So it's hard to see what would shake Republicans at this point if they haven't been shook yet. Well, Tom, I'm Iranian American, and I'm concerned about U.S. policies in the Middle East. You talk extensively about anti-war and anti-militarization of uh, of our country. Um, how do would you address the current conflicts with Iran and in Syria, and what would be the way you think our government should pursue those conflicts currently? Well, big broad question there. Um, on Iran, uh, Iran is an obsession in this country. Um, Hillary Clinton, for instance, was all over it, and she was, uh, you know, the, the the peace candidate relatively of the two. Um, Americans have little knowledge, and I'm sure you know this, right? Um, I'm, I don't think there's a lot of grown-ups in Iran who don't know that the U.S. engineered the overthrow of the Mossadegh government in the 50s. There are not a lot of ad adults in this country who understand that. Um, and we have this very sequestered view uh, of the world, and Congress uh, is a big part of it. There is simply no reason for this ongoing animus uh, against Iran, in my, my view. It is mixed up in Middle East politics um, that have everything to do with oil um, and nothing much to do with the Iranian people. Well, I mean, we just uh, agreed to protect the oil in, the, in Kurdistan um, and leave all the Kurds behind. Um, that's a betrayal of uh, every form of military principle, every form of human rights principle, to leave your allies hanging um, and having them be ethnically cleansed, basically, out of their own region. Well, yeah, let me, let me speak to that. I'm actually uh, introducing a, re a resolution before a political club tonight on, on that very topic. And here again, I think that the discussion in this country is just cut into the smallest part of what it should be. What are the options uh, in Kurdistan, according to what has gone on in the U.S. Congress and the national media? Uh, it's either to say to Turkey, essentially, go ahead. 
uh, do whatever you want with the Kurds, or its continual U.S. presence in Syria uh, among the many countries that we have uh, military in. The vote in Congress, every single Democrat condemned Trump for removing the troops. I do not think that's the way the, the issue ought to be cut, and I think it's destructive for the Democrats in the long run to limit it that way. They appear to be the party of permanent war as a result of this, and Trump appears to be the party to a lot of people of, who wants to extricate ourselves. What has not been introduced is the question of cutting off Turkey's arms. We are the largest supplier to them. We pull the strings on Turkey in terms of their armaments. You will see action. Wouldn't but, they just go to the Russians just like they did for the last missile defense system that they were buying from them? I mean, if we fill, wouldn't the Russians fill that vacuum? Um, in the long run, it, I suppose it is possible. But in the short run, we overwhelmingly are the main source. And the other countries that are the uh, secondary sources, uh, the UK and Germany, cut off arms sales that could be used uh, in Syria immediately. It was an obvious step for them. But Congress can only apparently think about deploying American troops and not withdrawing arms. So you talk extensively about reducing military industrial complexes role in our society and in our and and then I've read a number of your blogs. You know, in this case, how would you reduce the military industrial complex's role? Because they benefit from selling to our allies. Clearly our economy benefits from that uh, enormously. Um, and if we don't fill that gap in the marketplace, they would simply go to get that from China or they would get that from the Russians. So, you know, how do you answer to the folks that say, what is the solution for cutting back military industrial complex? What are you going to replace it with? Well, a uh, couple of questions there. We are the dominant provider of uh, military hardware in the world. So for us to be talking about that we're acting as if we live in fear that everybody else is going to overwhelm us is just not, not real. Um, the U.S. is not powerless in this situation. It has immense power. Um, the, I'm sorry, you had a, a second uh, part of that question. Was it just being able to reduce the, 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 com the industry that's behind right. well, it, this complex what, that you're among talking the about? Things the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the rest. Among the things you have to do is stop producing it, stop selling it all over the world. So you have to make a decision um, that you're going to try and get out of it. When you're the top dog, you are in a position to at least talk to the others about, can we all start to get out of the business? It's not going to be started by the smaller producers. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's up to us. Great. Um you know, one of the things that I'm concerned about as an Iranian American is my rights to privacy. Um, and we know that the, the corporations have a lot of data on us. The government has access to that data, and they can use it as they see fit. What would you do to ensure the rights of civilians be protected in terms of if you get into office um, in regards to our privacy? Well, um there's a, a number of aspects to it that, that are easier handled than others. Um, in some cases, this data gets into the hands of private companies because they're subcontractors. So the question of regulating the exchange of that information and the use of that information improperly is probably the easier part uh, of it all. The more difficult part is the question of something like the NSA. Um, we can and should be legislating um, to roll back their surveillance for sure. Do we believe that's what really happens uh, when we legislate it is another question. And it brings us to a much larger uh, need for a sea change in foreign policy. Um, the question of why agencies like the NSA and the CIA should be allowed to continue as they are um, is not clear to me, in the sense that we talk now about abolishing ICE, not because we think there's no legitimacy to the functions it serves, but because we think the, the agency is hopelessly compromised. Uh, I think we're dealing with a situation like that with agencies like the CIA and the NSA. They should be broken up 
something that um, is structured to do the job properly in a confined way should be put in their place. It seems like these companies, organizations, entities, um, companies have our data and we, they know a lot about us. But yet, if I ask you, when was the last time that an audit does, was done of Department of Defense or when an audit was done, the NSA was done, nobody can give me an answer. Um, so for me, it's really strange that they feel that they, everybody else needs to be held accountable, yet they have no accountability. Um, in terms of... No, we, we, if I'd say we absolutely need a paradigm shift. I was struck one point. I, you know, I mentioned the, the CIA because you mentioned the NSA. I was... Um, um, in Bangkok a couple of years ago in a place called the uh, Jim uh, Tompkins House, I think I may have it slightly off, which was a, it's a place that has these beautiful old structures from, from Thailand. And the story is it was put together by this sort of adventurer guy who just disappeared at one point. And so the, the guide talks to you about what happened, et cetera, and she says, we don't know what it was. Did he commit suicide? Did he start a new life? Was it the CIA? And I thought, this is an international joke, the CIA, that if you look for an evildoer in the world, it should be included in the list. And that was sort of like the moment it struck me, this needs to stop. There shouldn't be an entity that is a joke, a sick joke like that. I think that's the uh, perspective we need to bring to these agencies. Well, unfortunately, they have had it, their hands into meddling so many countries. This is business uh, and politics over the years, and they have a lot of blood on those hands. Um, I'm, I'm so um, continuing with the questions around privacy, the role of big tech. Everybody talks about you know Facebook and. Um, Microsoft and Apple's and all the com big companies and their influence in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, what's your view towards these tech companies? Um, how should they be regulated, if any? Do you see them being regulated? If so, what would that regulation look, up, look like? Do they need to be broken up? Well, um, if you want to include one of the ones you didn't mention just now, Amazon, that yes. to me is the most obvious one. Um, they are producing and, uh, uh, goods that, uh, in which they, they dominate the marketplace for selling. They are competing with the people they sell against. That ought to be separated. Um, there is now some new broader sense in uh, antitrust activity, uh, which is, in recent years has been confined just to consumer interest, meaning low price. And tough to fault Amazon on that one, right? Uh, they've lowered the price past what a lot of companies can, uh, can afford to sell. Um, but there is a new uh, view, a return to an old view, really, that uh, we need to look at large corporations in terms of their impact upon society at large, their workforce, etc. cetera. Um, and while Amazon delivers cheaper prices, uh, there are uh, benefits, there are uh, negatives, I should say, um, that are rippling out from it all the time, down to the level of the, the people that are coming up in stories now who, hit, who are hit by delivery trucks that Amazon subcontracts to, and they're driving without a lot of uh, experience, um, and people are being hurt by this. Um, if you get to the others, uh, Twitter just agreed not to take political ads. No one made them do that. That's a good thing. Uh, you may know there's a candidate running for governor in California now. He's not really a candidate for governor. We're not having an election now. But he's done it so that he can put uh, ads on Facebook and lie in them. Um, so to show what a farce it is, because Facebook has serious impact on people. The upside of the internet, obviously, is the spread of useful information. The downside is the spread of bad information. Yeah, but it seems like uh, tech companies know how to market, but what they care about is marketing to that database of users that they have collected and figuring out what the best offer it is for them to maximize the attention time and the time that they spend on their devices. Um, it's interesting for me, uh, by working 20 years in the tech community, 
on how priorities kind of have shifted in the past 10, 15 years. Not that we weren't focused on making money back in those days, we were, but it wasn't so influenced by defense contractors and role of defense industry. You know, when you think about big tech, you should also consider organizations like um, HP Enterprise and you know, the old computer science corporations of the world uh, that are still active and they're still contracting on behalf of U.S. government. So your data, your information doesn't reside with the U.S. government. It actually resides on private contractors. And um, I think that's really a point to note out um, to people. Um, Tom, uh, where do you see us being a year from, a year and a half from now with the elections? Um, do you think the country is going to be united again in terms of its getting behind the political and, and, the road, and the American roadmap for a better future? Or, or is it going to be a very divided country like we have today? Um, I don't see it being undivided. It was uh, divided when Obama was in, uh, in the sense that there were people who considered him uh, the Antichrist, or yeah. if you will. Um, not people I knew, but uh, the, the, the division is deep, uh, obviously. The, the, the question is which side comes out on top. Uh, um, if I, I've been a Sanders supporter unabashedly for some time. I was a delegate for his in 2016, support him again. Um, uh, if he wins, uh, I think that will be a sea change uh, in, in American politics. Um, and depending on how he is able to do in Congress, sometimes um, a new president can make people start believing different things in, uh, under uh, the Capitol Dome. It happened with Ronald Reagan, and it, and it went to the right. Um, but uh, what um, Sanders proposes, and I will say to a, a, a great extent Elizabeth Warren as well, um, is a radical re-altering of uh, the structures of government and the degree to which it concerns itself with growing inequality, the degree to which it, it concerns itself with runaway corporate um, control, um, and to a, a, a lesser degree but significant in terms of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, omnipresence uh, militarily in the world. Okay. Um, well, Tom, I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Those were primarily my questions that I wanted to get answered. Um, and I'll follow up. I'll send you a copy of the video. And that hopefully, uh, you can share it with your audience online uh, if, if you think it's uh, to your liking. But um, hopefully, uh, we covered everything uh, that I wanted to cover. And I wish you much success. So oh. thank you so much. All right. Thank you.